Super. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is a, a really fantastic opportunity to discuss, and of course, it, it can't come too soon. Uh, I'm a researcher from University College London, and at University College London, uh, we're part of a group of eight universities across Europe who think there is a privacy and data protection way, a much more proportionate way, to allow contact tracing that epidemiologists say they need and say they want to, to try in this particular crisis. Um, without risking uh, really what uh, some of the fundamental rights we're trying to protect around data centralization, misuse of technology, um, and, and a, a potential function creep into other areas of our liberties. So uh, the technology we, we have proposed is called DP3T. It's a protocol um, which is, uh, is decentralized in nature. And what this means is that personal data, identifiable personal data in the sense of data protection law, um, does not actually leave an individual's device. We, we avoid creating a centralized database that can be misused or, or reused in ways that are, are not good for, for fundamental rights. But we also uh, create the insights and the functions that epidemiologists have told us that they need. Uh, effectively, uh, the digital tracking apps uh, that, that we are proposing don't use location data. This uses a huge amount of battery, is very, uh, is very coarse in nature. Epidemiologists have been saying we're not really sure location is a useful vector for um, a proportionate vector for exploring this disease. Um, you can't work out if two people passed. Uh, people might be on different floors of the same building, very far away. Um, and people just won't use it because their battery will, will run out on their phone. Um, not only that, this data is very hard to effectively anonymize in any way. Um, so instead, we focus on a technology that, that a lot of smartphones have since the early 2010s, since really 2012 or so, and that's called Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, it's a technology that allows the listening and pinging out of uh, small pieces of data on a regular interval. And we can also estimate the distance away that those data come from. So Bluetooth Low Energy is a... Uh, a system which, in theory, uh, everyone can have enabled on their phones and can start to interact with other people to understand contact uh, links. Uh, the functionality of the system, the, the, uh, of all these contact tracing systems, is effectively such that when an individual goes and gets tested, they, uh, they receive a test, and again, this relies on tests existing, so technology can only work with an enabling policy environment. These tests exist, uh, and uh, an individual can then say, oh, I have now tested positive. And then a computational process happens by which people who have come in close contact, we're talking 10 or 15 minutes for maybe two, three meters away. That's the estimates we have right now. Um, with that, that individual, will just get an anonymous pop-up created locally on their phone to say, you are at risk. It won't say who or where or how. Um, it will just say, please take this action. So that's the functionality we try to put in place. There are two main ways that you can make this kind of system. One is that effectively, the data that you are sending out, these are random numbers generated all the time that are not uh, recognizable to people and they can't be used to track you across time. These random numbers and the random numbers that everyone else is listening to end up in the same central server. And this central server can create a detailed social network of these individuals. Um, and this is very rich and sensitive data, of course. This is the kind of data that companies like Cambridge Analytica were seeking to access because it was so rich in nature. This is not the same data, but it is the same structure of data. The problem with this system is you can reuse and misuse this in quite a lot of ways, also to stratify society, also to, uh, to potentially stigmatize individuals and apply uh, coercive interventions against them. And in a world where this is a really truly global pandemic, uh, we have to be careful that the protocols that we make also work in countries that do not have the uh, very strong legal protection for human rights, such as that that the ECHR can provide, uh, and such as that that the rule of law provides inside member states that have strong respect for it. So we think we need to build an alternative system, and that was our mission. And our alternative system is designed such that this central database is never created because it is not technically necessary. So with this database, with this system, uh, your phone only uh, it listens to what it hears and it sends out its random numbers. And when you are tagged as infected, you go and have a test. 
you are allowed to upload these random numbers anonymously that you have sent out, constantly changing random numbers. The server just has a large bucket of these random numbers. It can't use them to profile people. It can't re-identify people from them. Uh, these don't connect to each other, let alone to individual devices. But what they can do is every day, everybody in that entire country downloads the list of these randomly generated numbers and can check in the privacy of their own device whether any of these random numbers that have, they have downloaded match the ones they have privately seen. So nobody sees what you have seen. Nobody can create that social network. It is like everybody has a piece of the jigsaw, but nobody has the full puzzle, but the jigsaw still actually is functional. So this is the, the essence of what we've seen. So we published this openly. We're working very openly uh, for criticism and for debate um, a couple of weeks back now. Uh, and, and we've had lots of revisions since with lots of feedback from cryptographers, uh, people from all disciplines feeding into this protocol, which is just a building block for an app. It's not the whole app. It's a building block for the app, but it's an important technical one. Now, last Friday, Google and Apple announced their partnership. Their partnership um, is very, they're, they're, uh, there's two parts of this partnership which are very interesting. Um, I'll start with the second part. The second part is that they announced that they will choose to roll out a similar app, a similar protocol to the one we developed, which is very technically similar. It similarly does not create a central database. We have some improvements we're suggesting to them um, to make it even more secure. Um, but it is not a, a, a doesn't give them control of a central database, and they're just providing building blocks to help member states create their apps. Now we can argue that it is a big power move for them to say we're going to provide only one set of building blocks, and maybe you should use it. But member states of all uh, you know, all nation states are actually free to use their own code instead. There is no reason why uh, they have to use Google and Apple's code. The second part, which is important is that um, on, uh, for, to save people's privacy on uh, iPhones, uh, iPhones are very protective of Bluetooth. They do not let the Bluetooth that contact tracing apps currently need you to be used without your phone screen being on at the time. So at the moment in Singapore, where an app has been deployed, people with iPhones have to leave their phones unlocked in their pockets. And if this means that their phone is stolen, it will not have a password on, all of their emails can be taken. Um, and if a state mandates people to leave their iPhones unlocked, it is arguably a severe breach of Article 8, I would say, um, because it, it creates a lot of insecurity for the most vulnerable citizens. So Apple have said that they will change this protocol, but only for privacy preserving apps like DP3T, which only do the matching on the device. There is a specific technical choice they have made to say, we will let people use the Bluetooth but we do not think that the centralized database is required for contact tracing. Therefore, we will not let those apps use it, uh, use Bluetooth that way. So that's the, that's the long and short of this. But I want to also end uh, on this, uh, this quick tour with a discussion of what protocols cannot do. So protocols cannot ensure that member states do not uh, effectively require you to show, not to show a risk score when you go into a cinema or a place of work or a place of leisure or recreation. Uh, and this is a big problem because that is a coercive use of this technology. And this is something that we cannot solve with code. We need law, we need respect for human rights to ensure that the way citizens are asked to interact with the risk scoring system is not in breach of their fundamental rights. Um, and that is uh, one key part uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is important. But what the protocol can do is effectively protect against this being used as an interlinked identity card that will follow you around anywhere. We can't protect about people, uh, we can't protect a law that says show us your device, but we can protect against um, interventions that require coercive use of central databases. And as I say, we're working closely with epidemiologists and they, they say this is the data we need for contact tracing. We do not need lots of other forms of miscellaneous data that people are, are, are suggesting. And one of the most things they need is they need adoption. So they need people to trust the technology. A minimal technology that can be rolled out among a huge proportion of the population is much more useful to them than, than people who are you know, a small proportion of the population giving a lot of their data and freedoms away. So thank you very much for inviting me to talk to this uh, webinar today. And I'm happy to take questions later on as they arise.